Liam Joe with the cross. Oh, yes! And it's the man who missed the penalty who scores the winner! What a story! And Chuan Juan! You're listening to the Kaylee United Podcast. Proud partner of Football Nation Radio. Hello and welcome to the K-League United podcast, continuing with our 2002 World Cup Rewind. I'm Paul Nee and joining me is a man who, in June 2002, was deciding which name to get on the back of his Man City shirt. Is it Sean Gota, the safe option? Is it the young wonder kid, Sean Wright Phillips? Or perhaps perhaps the left field choice of Danny Tiato? Mm. It's Matthew Bins. Hello, Paul. And we are joined from the start this time by our very own Jung Miol. Miol, in 2002, Sazinia was just 13 years old. Cheongun's screaming was limited to the to his kindergarten classroom. And Cho Gwang Rei was the uh, the manager of LG Anyang Cheaters. But Miol, how are you? Yeah, I'm great. And yes, back in 2002, I was just ordinary middle school, no, high school, not yet middle school student in Daegu. Living the dream in Daegu, still waiting for Daegu FC to be founded. But uh, actually, speaking of uh, getting named on the back of football shirts, what was the first shirt that you bought, You guys bought with a name and number on the back? And which uh, player did you get? We'll start with Matthew. Uh, mine was, uh, I remember, um, it was the 2003-2004 home kit for Man City. Uh, um, it was McManaman, <laughs> based Steve McManaman, based on uh, a decent debut against Villa, if I recall. I got it on my shirt uh, when City if that season. City were in fourth in November, or they were on the cusp of fourth, and then uh, they were, they played Leicester, and we went up. My dad and my brother went up to watch it because we live in Leicester, and it's great to beat them. I hate it. I was the only one not supporting Leicester winning that <laughs> 2016 title. But yeah, we went up, and then uh, City lost three nil, and it was like the a, a run of defeats that lasted like 18 games or uh, not. Well, not defeats, but an un- well, winless yeah, run. A win. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, it took forever to get a win after that, and when we well, ended up the, the season threatened by relegation. But yeah, the man politely uh, the man behind me politely informed McManaman uh, when he was going up for a corner that he was um, a great donkey and uh, a great donkey not any yeah, donkey a great no, donkey it's just this McManaman you great donkey and he turned and heard us and I uh, yeah <laughs> and I kind of felt daft wearing it since fair enough Mugol how about you well I think the first kid with the names and number on it is 2002 South Korean kid but not this kid because I bought uh, I bought the replica version first, okay. but I didn't have a name on it on the back, so I said, okay, let let's let's get the proper one. So I got this one. This is the player version with the Hwang Son Hong name on it. So nice. yeah, this is the first one I got it with the names who is, on it. Who is the um, the first Daegu kit that you got with the name on well, the back? Uh I think it's a it's yes. I think it's a North Hangle in two thousand three. Ah. Well, that's a, because at the first a couple of years actually, Daegu didn't provide. Daegu didn't actually sell any printing on the back. They just oh. only sell the just the replica kits only. Yeah. So we cannot have actually go for any players. I see. So I bought just a plain shirt first, and then I got the number later fair enough well confession time i the first marking as we say in korea that i got on a press and shirt was my own name oh. number three because oh, i left back yeah i don't know why i did that and not even my name it was my nickname it was neaty not not, not oh. even just neat on the back yeah i was yeah <laughs> but that was actually in 2002 to be fair um then i i mean i, I didn't get any for, for years and years and years and then i got paul gallagher on the back must have been 2015 because when I went back to England to visit, he scored in the the game at Deepdale that I went to, first game in years. So I wanted to get his name on the back to kind of like, you know, as a, a tribute. But in terms of Dejon, I got Zhao Paolo in 2013. We had him on loan from Guangzhou um, just because he's a foreigner. I was like, well, I'll just, I'll just get the foreign player's name. No idea if he's any good or not. 
But then 2014, I met the captain, Yin Wan Il. He was doing like, like a fan signing thing outside the stadium. I think he must have been injured or suspended or something. So I met him. He's a very nice guy. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to get his name on the back of my shirt. Uh, and that's kind of kind of been a theme. If I if I've met them or there's some kind of like I don't know story, then I'll get them. So on the shirt for this year, 2022, I got I got a Toyumin because I met him mm-hmm. and spoke to him after the Gimpo away press conference. So there we go. But uh, Korea shirts, obviously, I've got this one that I'm wearing now. But the first one I got was in 2018. That was the World Cup. Obviously, I got I got two. I got Goyohan. So I wanted to have a K-League player on the back, and there wasn't that many options that I wanted to get. Um, but anyway, enough about shirts. Let's have a look. Um, so far, we've had, obviously, into the 2002, we've gone past the group stages, some surprise exits in this World Cup. France, Argentina, and Portugal all failed it, failed to make it to the round of 16. Korea did, and they faced Italy on this very day, 20 years ago, June 18th, 2002. But before we get to the match itself, let's catch up with some things that were happening in around the world at that time. Bins, what have you got for us this time? Well, I just thought we'd uh, stick to film news this week, Paul, because as teased in our opening pod, Scooby-Doo has arrived in the US cinemas and it's, uh, it's looking strong to top the box office, Paul. It's overtook the sum of all fears empire magazine's two-star review of the movie says anyone looking for sophistication from a movie which features a two-minute long farting contest between man and a cgi dog is going to be sorely disappointed so yeah that's in cinemas now uh, also the this week saw the release of the born identity starring matt damon and elsewhere uh, lilo and stitch also in the charts some future classics there if uh, if ever there was any Right then. All right. Well, that's the news, or that's the entertainment news at least. Let's uh, let's get down to it. We're in Daejeon. We're in my hometown this time, my Korean hometown, anyway. But Muyol, obviously, you were in Korea at the time. You were getting yourself ready for this huge match against Italy. What were your thoughts on getting Italy in the round of sixteen? They had a bit of an a sort of average group stage: one win, one drawn, one lost. But were you worried about facing them? Of course I was, I think. I think most of Koreans were worried because they, I mean, even though they had like a pretty average group stage performance, they are still big name in world football and we, we knew what they actually are were capable capable of on the pitch. So we were very, very worried. So what were you expecting? Just maybe this, just, this is where just, our journey just, ends? Uh, well, yeah, probably just this. This is the end of our journey. I mean, just already getting in, getting to the like getting to the like round of sixteen is already huge achievement for South Korean team. So, I mean, afterwards it's just a bonus for us. So, where did you watch the game? Oh. Well, <laughs> home. Yeah, it's it's just a late kick off. Yeah, it's just home. Yeah. Photos. All right. Well, I think the teams are out. Muyol, can you run us through the Korea team first? Yes. Uh, so Korea team were set up in a three-four-three diamond formation. So goalkeeper the safe hand Lee Unje and the three back Choi Jin Chul, Hong Myungbo, and Kim Tae Young. And in the midfield, Song Jong Gook, Yu Sang Chul, Kim Nam Il, Lee Young Pyo, and up front. Park Ji Sung, An Jung Hwan, Seo Gi Hyun, and captained by Hong Myung Bo, number 20. Fair news, yes. Yeah. Same 11 which beat Portugal, of course. And then for Italy, led by manager Giovanni Trapattoni, you got number one, Jean Luc Buffon, number two, Christian Panucci, five, Mark Luliano, three, and captain Paolo Maldini, four, Francesco Coco, 19, Jean Luca Zambrotta, 17, Damiano Tomasi. Number six, Christian Zanetti. Ten, Francesco Totti. Twenty-one, Christian Vieri. And number seven, Alessandro Del Piero. So three changes, actually, to the Italy team, which drew with Mexico in their final group stage game. Cannavaro is suspended. In comes Luliano. Maldini comes inside to centre-back. And Coco comes in at left-back. And then up top, Del Piero is in, in place of Flippo Inzaghi. Okay. Uh, thoughts on the team sheet? 
Uh, and Jung Hwan is preferred up front alongside Sao Ki Hyun. Muyo? Well, on a personal note, I was disappointed because my favorite player, Hwang Son Hong, didn't get selected because he was rested in a in the last group stage game against Portugal. So I was expecting him to start. But however, it, it makes sense because like An, he was he was playing in Italy by then, so he knew how to play against Italy player. So and An Jung Han was actually much younger than the Huang Son Long, so he, he has more energy and more stamina. Yeah, fair enough. Right then, well, the game. Let's let's go over to to Dejon. The game's on the way, and I must, I must say, even as early as fifty seconds in, the 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 noise, especially the the booze as Italy got the ball, was so so loud. But it was a bit of a breathless start, really, because five minutes in, and Korea get a penalty. Panucci has his hands all over Sol Ki Hyun's shirt, and the referee points to the spot. Now, what I would say is that. You're supposed to wait until after the game to try and swap shirts, not when five minutes of the game have only gone. But there's a huge, huge roar as the crowd from the crowd there as the referee points to the spot. Song Chong Go will take it. Penalty! Penalty is given in the opening minutes. The Korean player who went down is applauding. The Italians are all round the official. It was Sol Ki Hung who went down and Panucci was the offender. Yeah, and Jung Hwan, he takes it this time after Il Young missed versus USA. So An tries to find the bottom left corner, but Buffon produces a superb save to deny An. And An cannot believe it. And Chung Hwan, it's a brilliant save. It's a brilliant save by Buffon. Yeah, what are your thoughts on, on that pen then, Muyol? Well, yeah, I think it's it's a really well-taken pen and it was really nice save from like a Buffon. I mean, just you cannot put the blame on Arn for missing this pen. I think it was just a superb save from Buffon. Indeed. Well, uh Italy then have uh, some of the ball. Tomasi gets the, gets the space to advance, supplies Vieri, but his shot is wayward. That might become a little bit of a theme later on in the game. Then it's Korea's turn. Kim Namil, his ball forward, draws Buffon out and forces him to head clear. Yeah, not too long after, and uh, Korea's goalkeeper is called into action, uh, producing a good punch from deep uh, Del Piero, a deep Del Piero free kick. Sorry. But on 17 minutes, and Italy take the lead. Totti's corner from the right, an in-swinger to the six-yard box, is met by Vieri, and the Italians are in front. Going, but at the moment, Korea just won't let them have any space or time at all. Oh, but it's gone in. And Vieri, once again, is the scorer. His fourth of the championship. Where did he come from? Seems to be the expression on the face of Eun Jae. Well, it's a great corner. It's a great corner as he comes in. And Christian Vieri is not only... Press conference. The Vieri actually told the press one goal would be enough for them to progress. So I think this was <laughs> like kind of like a sign for us like to just collapse. And his celebration, he was uh, telling the crowd to uh, be quiet as he ran... Mm -hmm. Towards the corner flag, well, that never, never really backfires. That does it? <laughs> ne never backfires. That kind of those kind of celebrations. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, fair enough. Um, yeah. So on we go. Twenty-one minutes. Yellow card for Totti. Uh, he's going to have to be careful now. No silly challenges, dives, or whatnot. Because um, yeah, he could end up getting himself sent off at this rate. Uh, Thirty-five minutes gone. There's a big chance for Korea. Song Chung Guk's pass ricochets off Coco. And fell to An Jung Hwan, who showed great movement to turn away from his man and dispatch a shot, but it goes wide. Yes, in the English comms, uh, Joe Royal, former Everson boss, said that was Korea's first real moment of danger. You, you would have to agree, which kind of shows how the first half had gone for Korea up until this point. Then 37 minutes, big, big save again from Ian Jay. Totti has been very busy 
Uh, he plays a lovely ball through to Tomasi, but that then Lee rushes out, makes himself big and thwarts the Roma midfielder. Great keeping. And then Chejin Chol very, very calmly clears the loose ball from more or less on the line. Yeah, so it's half time. South Korea nil, Italy one. Vieri's near post header giving the Italians a slender lead at the break. Muriel, your thoughts on the first half? We were extremely nervous. We didn't take the chance, and we were one nil behind at half time. It doesn't. It, it looks like there's no way for us to find the way, and then just I think that the game looks like it, it's just on their. It's it's, it's just on their way. For one nil win for Italy. You, you, so you're saying that at this point you'd kind of just resigned yourself to defeat. You th- you just kind of accepted yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Because I I think because we didn't we didn't show any sign of like a getting back into the game unless uh, except for that one chance we created when the An Jong Han shot actually went wide. But yeah. other than that, just just we were. Almost like a clueless, I think, after we, we missed the pen. Well, things uh, nearly went very badly wrong early into the second half, 50 minutes in, and Kim Tae Yong is perhaps quite lucky not to have been sent off. He elbows Del Piero in an off the ball incident. Hong Kong Bo, the, the mediator, is all very calm. Even Del Piero, who might have been, might have felt like he, that he could have been a little bit animated or, or sort of. Uh, more aggressively protesting why perhaps Kim Tae should have been sent off. Vieri, though, was lo- was quite lucky not to be dismissed in the first half for an elbow as well. So perhaps the referee was trying to even things out. The referee was well positioned uh, and saw this incident quite clearly. Muyol, obviously you've seen this. What did you think? Is Kim lucky there not to get sent off? I think I think he he, he was lucky. Not to be sent off, to be honest. Like by modern football standard, with the VAR in place, I think he would have been sent off for that elbowing. Fair enough. Well, um, yes. Heading into the hour mark, An Jung Hwan has a pop. It's uh, from a free kick, but it goes over. Then Vieri has a big chance, one on one, but it's on his weaker right foot, and the shot, well, frankly, is quite poor. Yeah, he has another chance shortly after as well. This time on his preferred left foot, but it, it go it forces a good block or intervention from uh, Ian Pio, who uh, recovers well after initially getting beaten by Vieri. Yeah, and at this point, it's worth pointing out that uh, Gus Hiddink had made a couple of subs. Sixty-three minutes, Huang Sonong is on Mugol's favourite on to replace Kim Taeyong at a striker for a defender. So that's you know it, it kind of shows you what was going through the mind of uh, Gus Hiddink at this point. Then Yi chun Su is on for Kim Namil on 68 minutes. Two very attack-minded subs there, Muol. Yeah, indeed. It was very attack-minded changes for South Korea. But like I said, we we were like we have nothing to lose for, for South Korea at this stage. Just it's like a no knockout stage. So defeat or like a like a, by mo, uh, by more goals. Defeat by more goals doesn't make any differences. So yeah. there's nothing else we can do. Just we need to find a yeah. way and keep attacking. That's it. Do or die. And then after a spell of good pressure from Korea, Lee chun Su causing problems again. He's quite the impact sub. Um, but heading into the last two minutes of normal time, and it's a goal, Sol Ki-hyun, sends Dejon Walk Up Stadium into raptures with the equaliser. It's patient and methodical build-up play from Korea. Park Ji Song feeding the ball into Hwang Sonong, who sends a nice little ball around the corner in towards Sol Ki Hyun. It's a little bit behind him. Touch of fortune because the ball isn't slightly behind Sol, but it hits the hand of Panucci, who can't get his bearings, and the ball falls onto the left foot of Sol Ki Hyun, who buries the ball into the bottom corner. Still, they keep the possession. Park Ji Sung looking for the return. Peel for handball. Not given with the ball. He's got in. And it's so key again. Three minutes to go. Incredible. 
Yeah, Mia, what you, at this point, like, what are you feeling? Are you giving up hope? I mean, just simply in incredible. It's it's hard to put into word how how did how I was feeling by then. Just like I didn't think we could actually get back into the game, but just like a very very lucky because the ball the ball literally fell to the like a Sergi Hans foot, so it was extremely lucky, but incredible. Yeah, and you think 88 minutes that would be it, but it wasn't. There was uh, another chance for Italy in the last minute for Vieri, yeah. uh, sliding in at the back post as he tries to get his right foot onto Tomasi's superb ball across, but it, it's a gaping miss. So, uh, yeah, will, will Italy go on to miss that rude opportunity? That, no. <laughs> will Italy go to rude that missed opportunity? Can't even speak. I'm that shocked. <laughs> Shell by, shot. Uh, <laughs> By Korea's uh, equaliser, but yeah, they came close. To, uh, Korea came close to finding a late win as well. Chad Duri's overhead kick was straight at Buffon, and uh, in the 92nd minute, Sol Kihan also had a chance uh, hitting the side netting from about eight yards out. But uh, yeah, they had all the opportunities of normal time, Paul. Yes, end of normal time. A slow start to the game, but uh, it definitely picked up in that second period. And it just shows the, the, the mindset, first of all, like we said, with substitutions and also the fact that they tried to go for the winner again. They weren't just content to think, oh, let's go into extra time. They wanted to get that done now. They wanted to get things done in normal time. Alas, uh, they did not. Uh, and we have to start extra time. Matthew. Yeah. First chance for Korea, and it came from a free kick. Hwan Sung Hong is uh, seemingly an innovator, judging by Barry Davis' response. And... Uh, he tries to send the ball under the wall towards the bottom right-hand corner, but Buffon is alert and parries the ball away to safety. But big, big moment came in the 12th minute of extra time. Totti goes down looking for a penalty following a challenge from Chejin Chol. Referee blows his whistle, but instead of awarding a spot kick, he books Totti, who, as we already know, has already been shown a yellow card, and he's off. Italy will have to play the entire of the second half extra time with just 10 men. Now, Muyol, in the English commentary, they said this was harsh. What were your thoughts on this decision? Uh, well, I think, I personally think, if you look at this incident only, I think this is a bit harsh. I mean, Lefri, he could have not make a call. He could have not made any call in that situation and let let the let the player just let the game just go. But he blows the whistle and he indicate the other way. So I think it's a bit harsh. But considering before this World Cup, I think there was like a, a lot of a lot a lot of talking, a lot of uh there's a guideline from FIFA, I think. This World Cup, the simulation is have severely right. penalized in this World Cup. So I think players should have taken hint from the guideline. That's a, that's a good point. Maybe it's harsh, but the players should have known better. Fair enough. Yep. Um, well, there, there we go. And you obviously you are a referee. You are a qualified referee. So you are qualified to make a statement like that. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we're into the second half of extra time now. Uh, Korea get the game back underway. Tomasi puts the ball back into the back. Uh, <clears throat> well, he puts it into the back of the net, but he's offside on 110 minutes. And then there's a sulky Hyun cross, Hwan Sung on header. It's a good move by Korea, trying to stretch Italy a bit with that man advantage, but they're still, still not finding a breakthrough. Still not finding a breakthrough. And they're not conceding either because another big, Big save again from Ian J in the 112th minute. Sulky Hun tries to back heel the ball away, but he's uh, he has Gattuso just behind him, who smashes it from just about six yards out. But Ian J again is there to Korea's rescue. I tell you what, one thing I want to say about Ian J. My God, he's so good. He was so good because I, me, uh, I was talking to about this with. Uh, Muyol about the team selection of the World Cup and stuff like that. And I was like, well, Kim byung ji on, on the bench, I found that quite surprising. But having watched all this and the big saves that Ian Jay has made, and he's a, he was a fantastic goalkeeper. But yeah, Sol was, was back defending and credit to him 
for that. But sometimes that happens, doesn't it? When a striker or a forward player, they try to help out defensively, it can sometimes cause more issues than they solve. Um, but there we go. Um, but then, Korea eventually find the breakthrough. On 117 minutes, we have a golden goal. Side three forward. Referee plays on. Which one two in possession. Lee Young Pyo with the cross. Oh, yes! And it's the man who missed the penalty who scores the winner. What a story! And Chung Huan has put Korea into the quarterfinals. They have matched North Korea, who were the first side from Asia to reach the quarterfinals. The Italians are out. Maldini cannot believe it. And I have sympathy for him because he has been to the final of Europe and the World Championship and been a loser both times. But what a story here. And Chung Huan is the hero of Korea. Just listen to the noise. Unbelievable. The, the, the noise from this crowd is enough to make the hairs on the back of your necks stand up. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah and Jung Hwan the hero. And Muyol, at the time, had you processed what was happening? Like, did you did you know it was a golden goal? Because, <laughs> I mean, it, it wasn't a common thing at, at, that, at that point. And, you know, you were through. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just, it, it was literally unbelievable. Just, I mean, just, we I we knew the golden goal would send the uh, the end of this game for either side and any team just who scored the golden goal will be through but i didn't think it will be it will be south korea to be honest mm-hmm. and then just literally just people on the street or people in the place they they couldn't believe either just they pinch just each other's or just they hug and it was just incredible moment in south korea's recent history um, yeah, um, unbelievable. Yeah, that's, that's a point. What? How did you celebrate afterwards? Obviously, you're only you know you're in middle school. Did you, did you try and sneak a little beer or something? Or <laughs> no, no, no. I I was a good boy, so you're a good no, boy. I, okay, I, fair yes, enough. I, I think um, if it was England that done this, I might have. If they, if we'd have won U ninety six, I might have. Actually, no, I was ten then, so no, that, that no. no, I definitely wouldn't have. Won. No, no. If it was two thousand two World Cup and I was fifteen, sixteen, I might, have, I might have tried and have a little beer. But <laughs> anyway, right, okay. Uh, well, that's enough of us talking about the game. Time now to welcome Nima Tavlai Rudsari, a journalist specialising in Italian football and co-host of the Italian Football Podcast, to hear how the result was taken in Italy. <laughs> All right, Nima, thank you. Welcome to the uh, K-League United podcast. First question that we're asking all of our guests is, um, how old were you? What were you doing in the 2002 World Cup? I was, I'm born 81, so I was 21 years old um, at the time. Uh, and I, um, I, was, uh, I, I, when, I was living in Sweden back then. Um, or I, yeah, because I, I went to, I finished sixth form or college, what you call it in the UK, and then went to Italy to study for six months immediately afterwards. That was in 2000. Um, and then I came back. Uh, but yeah, and no, I was living in Sweden at the time. I remember the 2002 World Cup very vividly, uh, because obviously on the back of the Euro 2000 and, and, and obviously the World Cup 98, which I actually was in Florence visiting family uh during the entirety of that it was an amazing experience they wow. had uh, in florence uh, or i mean all over italy they do that but they have they have, a, they have a big park in florence really nice park and they had this like big screen tv like enormous huge thing thousands of people watching italy play and of course 98 losing on penalties against france um and then euro 2000 france again in that yeah. horrible way yeah. uh, and then yeah and then 2002, that was supposed to be Francesco Totti's big, you know, big tournament. Yeah, um, didn't quite pan out for him in that in this particular game that we're going to talk about. The obviously the game against South Korea in the round of 16. Where did you watch that game? Uh, we were. I was at a friend's house. Uh, I, I went went over to a friend's house because uh, living in Sweden, I I don't like watching Italy's game out in public because 
the um, it's uh, it's a very Anglo centered football culture in the sense, and they don't really understand Italian football, the general people, and you know they come with these tired old stereotypes uh, constantly, and I just I just get anno annoyed. Um, so I, I prefer it's the same thing when I'm watching Inter or whenever I'm watching any. I mean, I, unless if I'm not at a stadium covering the game, um, then I prefer watching it alone, to be honest, because then I can. I can uh, curse <laughs> uncontrollably and not be cancelled for it. Yeah, uh, I can sit there alone in my room and say all sorts of things and be annoyed, and then <laughs> and that'll be that's that. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So obviously, as you just said, it, uh, Italy were runners up at Euro two thousand. So obviously, we're getting to the World Cup two thousand two. Was at least getting to the semis or the final or going on to win it. Was that the expectation for Italy back back then? Yeah, I mean, let's not beat around the bush. That was, yeah. that was, uh, that was a fantastic team. You know, Paolo Maldini. I mean, that 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 generation of players. Uh, you know, Trapattoni, one of the best, if not the best, Italian. You know, coach, domestic coach. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of what he won with, he won everything uh, with Juventus. Literally everything yeah. at club level, and then he went and did repeated. He had fantastic success with with Inter as well. Um, and then, you know, you know, he started his, you know, traveling around Europe. He was in Bayern Munich and, and all that did well there as well. I mean, so, so, you know, him taking over, uh, was, was, uh, you know, there were high expectations and obviously Italy had a fantastic team, absolutely world beaters, uh, you know, Del Piero, Totti, Inzaghi, Vieri, uh, Maldini, Cannavaro, Nesta, uh, Pirlo, Gattuso. I mean, you know, it was just. You know they they had fantastic Zambrotta. I mean, he was world class players. The Buffon, you know, it was it was it really was a world class team. And there, you know, there they were expectations of at least a semi final. I certainly remember thinking, you know, what, you know, counting on that. Yeah. So in the group stage, then having those expectations, they finished as runners up with uh, one win, one draw, and one loss. What, what was the reaction to that? And in terms of the performances as a whole in the group stage? Well, they got, I mean, it kind of started looking weird because they did get screwed over in the group stages as well. Um, you know, the goals disallowed for reasons yet no one understands. Um, you know, that game they lost, I think it was a Croatia, wasn't it? Um, it was, yeah. Yeah, and 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 I mean that that game was just horrific. Uh, how they got, you know, the referee was just not with them. Um, the first game they were they just breezed Ecuador off, if I'm not mistaken, uh, two nil. Vieri scoring both goals, if I'm not out, if I'm not mistaken. And then you had um, the last game against Cameroon, wasn't it? They were a goal down, and then Del Piero. Heads home the goal. equalizer. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it was you know it, it was a difficult situation that they put themselves in. They won the first game easily; everything looked great, and then it all kind of went, went pear shaped uh, against Croatia in the second game, and they were under pressure now all of a sudden. Um, and but they managed to go through in the end, um, and it looked okay. So things were like okay, now the World Cup really starts, uh, and and they you know they weren't exactly faced with a insurmountable opponent in South Korea. Yeah, so I was going to come to that next. Obviously, South Korea finished top of Group D. It was obviously a big surprise considering how tough their group was. So then facing South Korea in the round of 16, there must have been a fairly easy win expected for Italy. Well, exactly. Um, and also the game started out that way. I mean, Italy scored pretty quickly and they dominated uh, the first half. Um, and uh, they, you know, felt, you know, they should have, they should have won that game pretty comfortably. It shouldn't have even gotten so tight, as tight as it actually did. Um, I remember that. <clears throat> I remember it. It was, uh, you know, Italy looked well. They looked good. They they controlled proceedings, but then, you know, the way that the, the it's played out, you know, Francesco Totti being s shown a straight red card for the most ridiculous reason again. Why? You know, that's, you know, you, straight red card for what? Uh, still to this day, don't know. Um, <laughs> and no one knows. Um, and then, you know, the, the equalizer, okay, fair enough. You know, if you, it's football, if you only have one nil lead, you can't back down back, you know, you can't defend too deep. Uh, and it kind of, you know, that hurt Italy. But, and, and also, you know, Cristian Vieri missing sitters and, 
and and uh, and all that you know that that was you know but it just became this nightmare the complaint the game the way the game went on it just felt like a nightmare um and they just completely lost control of everything um and, and the more you know the more the game went on it just felt like well well south korea are going to score the winner now aren't they yeah um because you know it just everything just was going against them and they just got completely screwed over to be honest i mean to me maybe you know to that world cup i think probably brazil would have won it anyway because they were from they had probably the best team or you know the way you know as it turned out you know, from now you know ronaldo at his absolute peak rivaldo ronaldinho you know lucio all the you know Cafu, all these fantastic players i mean they were they were fantastic and they probably would have won it but the way that italy was you know we were screwed in that world cup does remember does does remain to this day you must have been feeling a one nil up after such an early goal, 18 minutes, I think it was, that we're on course here. You know, yeah. it, it, no, it can't go wrong from it. here, surely. No, exactly. They controlled it. They controlled proceedings. Everything looked great. They were balanced. South Korea were completely nullified. They weren't creating anything. Um, and then, you know, that sending off kind of changed everything, really. Yeah. Solky can equalized uh, with about two minutes left of normal time. Then, of course, yeah. the Anjong Hwan scored the golden goal. 117th minute what yeah. was your reaction to that was it just a pure shock no well it felt like the more you know after that equalizer came and so late and totti had been sent off and, and all that it just felt like this isn't you know mentally italy you know in these situations they they put you know they they, they tend to you know they are mentally strong but when they end up in these situations it just feels like they kind of it becomes bigger than what it is and and they will look nervous uh and and it felt to me that it was just a matter of time before and especially with with Vieri missing sitters as i alluded to after the equalizer that just felt like okay this isn't this is becoming one of those it's not their day kind of thing so when that happened it, it was shock but it was also a little bit like okay what we've been fearing is now a fact yeah and obviously it was a golden goal did you know that at the time obviously we yeah. we were aware of of the of that rule but in the moment where it's like oh no it, that that's it now yeah no, no, it's everyone. No, no, everyone was aware of it. And yeah, it seems like such a long time ago to, that that rule was obviously still in place. It's kind of weird to think that that we had the golden goal rule. But um, yeah, Andrew Wan, of course, was at the time playing for an Italian team. He was on Perugia. the books of uh, a Perugia on loan. A lot's been said about what happened to him afterwards. How was this situation seen in Italy, and is it still talked about now? Yeah, but you have to remember the president of uh, Perugia, Luciano. Uh, <laughs> he he was a very uh, he was a very special person, wasn't he? I mean, he <laughs> was, everyone knew that. You know, we I interviewed Marco Negri, who played for Rangers as well. He came from Perugia, and, and he you know they used to call him. The, the, he he told us in the interview we did for the Italian Football Podcast that you know Luciano's nickname was the Hurricane. Um, you know, they called him the hurricane because he was crazy. He was incredibly eccentric and funny and, and, and crazy. And, and, and so, of course, you know, when the way, you know, he tried to sign two Swedish female national football team players for Perugia, Hanna Jungberg and Victoria Svensson, uh, as a thing to play in the Serie A, just because they were, they were so good at the time. They scored so many goals. You know, he liked to create news. Uh, he enjoyed the limelight. And, of course, he, I think, you know, he was angry at Ang Jungwan for scoring against Italy and, and saying that, you know, he, I cannot, you know, he's not going to play here ever again. And he just murdered Italian football and all that. But it was, that's just typical of, uh, of him to react that way, isn't it? Um, I see. He was a, yeah, he was, he was a very... Very, very, um, very uh, <laughs> special person I in see. that sense. So it wasn't really taken too seriously in Italy with the, the kind of things that he was saying about Andrew Wan. No, I mean it was an. It was, if most people kind of felt, well, it's just business as usual with with this with this mm -hmm. football with this president. Um, yeah. You know, it's not. It's not. It, <laughs> he, yeah. it, that's not even. That, that's that's not even the craziest thing he's ever done. <laughs> um, no, it's just that's just a it's just a Tuesday afternoon for him. Yeah. So yeah. Well, you've talked about obviously the some of the decisions that went against Italy. I, I think the Totti one was the second yellow card, but there were obviously things that have that happened in the World Cup for Italy and in that game. Are these things still talked about now um, among Italian fans about sort of how things went wrong and it was seen as not being completely fair, even though all these all these years later. Well, of course. I mean, he is considered 
the most, you know, by Byron Moreno, I mean the referee, the is considered yeah. one of the, the most hated, hey, one of the most hated people in ever in Italy, uh, the most hated man in Italy at the time. He most certainly was, but he, um, he, you know, that that's something that that is never forgotten for the by those of us who are alive. Yeah. But obviously, then Italy, of course, went on to win the World Cup uh, next time around. Did that feel like a redemption for everything that had happened? Um, yes, um, it did, because the way it happened as well, I mean, obviously, Calciopoli scandal and, and with Juventus and especially Juve being involved and Milan as well, to a certain extent, to a lesser extent, uh, of course. But, uh, you know, and then Gianluca you know, Pesotto trying to, you know, trying to commit suicide and you know, all of that, you know, uniting the group and the way they did it. I mean, Italy played the best football of that World Cup. They they just, um, they 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 were solid defensively, but they played good football, played good attacking football as well. They, you know, Luca Toni, who was in his absolute peak as a striker and, and was a world-class striker then. Um, so, no, it, it felt like redemption more for all the... You know, for the for the screw for the Scandinavian screw job in the Euros yeah. two thousand four, two years earlier, when yeah. Denmark and Sweden obviously played two 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 on purpose to get Italy out. Um, there was actually reports of a Swedish uh, Swedish journalist who were there at the game saying some players, some Swedish players screaming at the Danish players, "Why don't you concede? You know, why don't you concede a goddamn goal?" And and the Danish player replying, "Why don't you attack?" And then obviously it ended two two, wow. and, and and the way it ended. I mean, there's no doubt that it is a screw job. It was a Scandinavian screw job. Uh, they, you know, two two would have kept Italy out, and and of course, so they 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 proceeded to play that way. Um, you know, we remember famously in the World Cup eighty two when Austria and Germany did something similar to get Algeria out. So I mean, these things happen. Um, and and I don't think it was like it wasn't a conspiracy, but people aren't stupid. You know, when they know that this result is good for everybody then everyone you know then people you know you won't attack um uh, same thing with austria and, and, and germany one nil both of them were going through so why would they bother you know why, why would austria bother attacking why would germany bother attacking you know it, it's yeah. one of those things but of course it's not exactly a it's not fair play of course but you know it's part of the game part and parcel of the game to me the the very idea you know how people pretend that this doesn't happen is 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 just ridiculous because of course it happened we all saw what happened but but having said that you know it was it was one of those things where you know after all these years you know USA 94 losing on penalties uh, Roberto Baggio you know the 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 way that Italy you know in, in the Euro 96 was such a disappointment and then 98 in the World Cup against Brazil uh, against France knock out you know penal penalties and then the same you know golden goal again 2000 euros and then 2002 golden goal and 2004 the Scandinavian screw job it was like it was so many screw you know so many so many failures close and bitter disappointments all in one you know obviously and, and it was the last chance for so many of them yeah, um, for these players. I mean, especially for someone like Del Piero, who had the chance to win the game in the Euro 2000 final against Spain, just kept missing so many sitters. You know, he scores the second goal against Germany uh, in Germany against B B in, in Dortmund to win. You know, redeeming himself. Francesco Totti suffering a horrible injury, coming back barely walking a few weeks. You know, you know, on crutches a month before the tournament starts and miraculously brings himself back to form. And, you know, he comes on against Australia again, coached by Goose Hiddink, who, you know, and that horrific refereeing where Materazzi was sent off for no reason whatsoever. Uh, that, I mean, that's a yellow card at best. And 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 Grosso winning the penalty and, and, and Totti scoring that penalty, you know, in the 90th minute. And, you know, kind of that's where I think the World Cup was kind of won for Italy. That's when they started believing because they were screwed over again uh, by a refereeing decision, but they managed to overcome it. And obviously Alessandro Nesta being injured in the group stages and Materazzi replacing him. And and him 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 becoming a symbol of this World Cup, you know, scoring twice, one against once against Czech Republic and in the World Cup final. So the two thousand two, so the two thousand six was really redemption for everything. Yeah. All right. Well, Nima, thank you so much for your insights and talking. It's been really really fascinating to hear how how it all was for Italy back back then. Obviously, a lot's, a lot's been said about that game and uh, and how things transpired. But yeah, thanks so much, and hopefully we'll see you again next time. 
pleasure pleasure be with you thank you cheers Uji Lewis is your neighborhood British bar and cafe located in the old Giro district of Seoul. Decorated in old English antiques and furniture for a true homely feel, you can enjoy homemade scones, cakes and afternoon tea during the day, and traditional British favorites like beef stew, English ale, and a fine selection of wines at night. Available for private parties or simply an evening out, Ulji Lewis is sure to become your favorite neighborhood pub. Be sure to mention Kaylee United at the bar during your visit and you'll get 10% off your bill. All right, welcome back to the Kaylee United podcast. South Korea's win ensured that for the first time in the Cup's history, teams from five continents, Europe, North America, South America, Africa and Asia, reached the quarterfinals of the same tournament. But, Matthew, there were some controversies in this match or in this World Cup just in general. Yeah, there was. Uh, this match is... <laughs> you only have to type this match into I, I, into Google. I just typed in Korea versus Italy 2002. And the picture you get is actually of the referee, Brian Marino. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. the YouTube that comes up is all about the the shame of... World Cup football. Before <laughs> it's it, there's a lot of uh, conspiracy theories and things that that come with this match, uh, sadly. And um, yeah, following Italy's elimination from the tournament, referee Brian Marino, his performance was criticised by members of the Italian team, uh, most notably attacking midfielder Totti, who was sent off, and uh, coach Giovanni Trapattoni for several contentious decisions he had made. Um, some team members even suggested a conspiracy to eliminate Italy from the competition, uh, while Trapattini even oblique, um, obliquely accused FIFA of ordering the official to ensure a Korean victory so that one of the two host nations would remain in the tournament. I mean, uh, Italy, it should be also be said, Italy were to, to fuel their conspiracy. They had had four goals disallowed in the group stages as well. They, yeah. they really believed. <laughs> They would anything to distract away from Trapattini's negative tactics, in my opinion. But yeah, that's uh, yeah. FIFA president Sepp Blatter he did wade in as he normally does on these things. Uh, he stated that the linesman had linesman had been a disaster and admitted that Italy suffered from bad offside calls from the group matches, but he denied conspiracy allegations. And while he criticised Totti sending off by Marino, Blatter refused to blame Italy's loss on the officials, stating. Italy's elimination is not only down to referees and linesmen who made the human, not premeditated errors. Italy made mistakes both in defence and in tact. And uh, not that I like to sit on the same side of a fence as Seth Blatter of mine, but, um, <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it's not often that you, that you look to Seth Blatter for uh, the voice of reason, is it? But, yeah, um, yeah I, I think in this game, the, the Kim Taeyong. That that was perhaps a red card. I I agree that was a red card. The Totti one was harsh, it, but then as Mio said, he you know the players were told at that time to be careful yeah. with simulation. But I still think it's a it's a it's a harsh second yellow. Um, so I can see why I can see why Italy were felt upset, but mm. it, it, it I don't don't. In my wildest dreams, would think it was anything untoward. Moving on, what what were your thoughts on that? At what point did you start to learn about these things that were being said about this match and the officials, and maybe that Korea were getting favorable decisions and things like that? Well, I think just I think immediately, immediately after this game was over, I think just. The, a lot of these, a lot of media were just a VG, like a, just spreading news. And then the day after that, I think some negative comments coming from Italy's team or other like a fans, like a, they can they were like being spread across the like countries. But I think. At the same time, I think the way actually the Korean player were treated by the Italy player on the pitch were actually horrendous. And some players interviewed, they, they, they said like, we were literally like a, 
we, we got smacked by the Italy player when the camera was not on them or like when the referee was looking at the other side, we got smacked or just we got hit by the Italy player. So I think there's nothing, no, no need to talk about the refereeing mm-hmm. decisions on this game. Yeah, I I think, I, I it sounds a bit, maybe a bit harsh, but I don't think, I think if it was in Italy as well, I don't think it would have had the same amount of press coverage it got. I feel that there, there's, there's kind of a, it's Italy and everybody is, they're expected almost to just progress past mm-hmm. career at this point in the, in their history. You know, obviously they're not qualified for a couple of World Cups since, but you know, there, there's this there's this weight of expectation. Oh, it's Italy. They're one of the yeah the top. They're the top four of football, aren't they? <laughs> and yeah. I think if it had been another team, I don't think it would have caused the same controversy. But I think mm-hmm. oh, because it's Italy. Oh, it must be a contra. It, it must there must be something more to it. it. It's clearly it can't just be the fact that the manager just decided to shut up shop once it got a one nil lead and started to defend. And it, it's surely nothing to do with the fact that. Italy just can't finish. I mean, they had chances to win this Vieri. game. Yeah. Yeah. Vieri, Vieri. You know, yeah. uh, <laughs> surely the conspiracy <laughs> start there. <laughs> who's, who's been who's been telling him to shoot like that? So um, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, poor officiating. Yeah, I don't know whether I'd, I'd, I personally buy into anything more sinister. But. Yeah. I, yeah, I think just Italy. Italy just they pay the price for. They her they are like a stance on taking this game because they like I said, the interview the day before, the interview the day before the game like a very said mm-hmm. like one goal would be enough and I think yeah. just, I mean they they could have scored more than one in this game but they didn't so they got mm-hmm. like punished in the end. To to finish it with like the commentator yeah. from Barry Davis, it was like Italy are out because they will not learn. He did say that, yeah. Yeah, he's such a good commentator, Barry Davis. Such a good commentator. Anyway, um, well, there was also what happened to Andrew Juan. He scored the winning goal. Uh, he missed the penalty. It was redemption for him, but things weren't too rosy for him because of where he was playing at the time, Matthew. No, it wasn't uh, Andrew Juan. He was actually playing his trade in Italy. Um, at Serie A side Perugia on loan from the Busan Deo Royals, um, for, later to become Busan I Park. Uh, the uh, the next day after the game, Perugia owner uh, Luciano Gauti cancelled Anne's contract and was quoted as saying, "I have no intention of paying a salary to someone who has ruined Italian football uh, due to the fact of the controversial and arguable win of career." Uh, Gauti stated that his decision was not due to the goal. But it was uh, due to comments by Anne about the Italian nation. Uh, Gachi did take this back, and a contract was offered to Anne, but Anne understandably rejected the offer and didn't turn up for pre season training, um, despite Perugia claiming ownership of his registration. Because Anne stated, I, I will no longer discuss my transfer to Perugia, who attacked my character instead of congratulating me for a goal in the World Cup. <laughs> Miel, your thoughts on this this news when it when it broke? Well, I found this news utterly like ridiculous. To be yeah. honest, it's, I knew uh... about it as well, and I I, I found it ridiculous. Can I just yeah. say, actually, obviously it's twenty years since the World Cup. I can't believe it's been ten years since I came to Korea. I was I was thinking that can't be right because I my first day. And I arrived in Korea in Daejeon. We would I was dragging my suitcases in the snow past Daejeon World Cup Stadium, because that's where I used to live, just up up the road in Noondong. And the guy who was showing me where to where where to go, uh, Liam, who was um the boyfriend, now husband of my then boss, he said, Oh, that's a stadium where An Jong Hwan scored that winning goal against Italy. And that was the first time I'd ever really heard of it. Mm-hmm. And that was that then was 10 years before that. I can't get my head around that it's 10 years since that moment. Mm-hmm. 20, I thought it can't have been 10 years. That, that was only 10 years old. It's bizarre. Bizarre. Time's gone too quickly. But yeah, even I had, had heard about this. Um, and it, it's one of those things where it becomes a legend, it becomes more of a 
like the probably perhaps more exaggerated when you the more it gets you know as time goes on but as we just heard from Nima in, the, in our interview with him earlier uh the the owner of Perugia at the time was a bit eccentric so you can perhaps see that he was he did have form for this kind of stuff but on a more serious note though in an interview from January 2013 in the Daily Telegraph the English newspaper and talked about some racist slurs from Italians during his time at the club. So redemption for him, um, both in the game and in life, I suppose, having missed the pen and then gone on to score the winner. Um, but let's end on, not that, not on racism, of course. Let's um, bring ourselves up to speed with the other results in the round of 16, Matthew. Yeah, round of 16 results then on the 15th of June. Down in Jeju, Germany took on Paraguay and came away with a 1-0 win. Thanks to Oliver Nouvelle on the, eight, in the 88th minute, Germany leaving it late. Then the evening game over in Japan in Nagata, Denmark lost 3-0 to Sven Goran Eriksson's England. Goals courtesy of Ferdinand Owen and Heskey. Uh, 16th of June then saw uh, Sweden fall to Senegal in Oita in Japan. Uh, Larsen scoring the opener before uh, Senegal find an equaliser through Kamara and Kamara again in the 104th minute, a golden goal. Um, eight, later then the evening in Suwon, Spain took on the Republic of Ireland. Morientes opening the scoring, but Keane, uh, Robbie Keane in the last minute scoring a penalty, taking it through to penalties, but Spain finding a way through 3-2 on penalty shootout. 17th of June, down in Jonju, Mexico faced the USA and the USA came out on top. Goals from McBride and Donovan saw them leave Jonju 2-0 victors. Meanwhile, in Kobe, Japan, Brazil defeated Belgium 2-0 thanks to goals from Rivaldo and Ronaldo. Then on the 18th of June, well, earlier today, should I say, over in Rifu, Japan, the co-hosts, they're out to Turkey, meaning that, as we've just discussed, the only host left in this tournament is Korea after their 2-1 win over Italy today. Indeed. So we have to uh, look at the quarterfinal fixtures. June 21st at 3.30 in, Shizu- uh, in where? In Sh- Shizuoka, England play Brazil. Then later in the day, 8.30 in Ulsan, Germany, will play the USA. The following day, June 22nd in Guangzhou. Spain will play South Korea and then later in that day in Osaka, Senegal against Turkey. Well, Korea's journey continues. We're off to Guangzhou for the quarterfinal with Spain. We'll see you there. Thanks for tuning in.
Uji Lewis is your neighborhood British bar and cafe located in the old Giro district of Seoul. Decorated in old English antiques and furniture for a true homely feel, you can enjoy homemade scones, cakes and afternoon tea during the day, and traditional British favorites like beef stew, English ale, and a fine selection of wines at night. Available for private parties or simply an evening out, Ulji Lewis is sure to become your favorite neighborhood pub. Be sure to mention K-League United at the bar during your visit and you'll get 10% off your bill. 